the one I did last year, but I have more. I'm going to do a longer demo, so I'm going to try and fly through the slides. And uh, I just want to say, if you're watching this at home, it's because of people like Albert Deng and uh, Patrick McAvoy and uh, Andrew Fengler, who have, uh, you know, and because I have watched uh, talks on YouTube and learning about OpenBSD and FreeBSD and the various BSDs that it actually allowed me to inspired me to learn more about it. And so I think the work that the conference organizers do, and indeed Patrick McAvoy is just uh, to stream it live uh, is incredibly important for the community and to all the people at home. That's because of people like uh, Patrick McAvoy who works extremely hard to get that stream working so and keep it working. Uh, so thanks. Um, it's 20 year anniversary, so just an introduction. I'm an admin, not a developer. So I'm CEO of Wireless Connect for my sins. Uh, and I also double up as a CTO because obviously we're a small company. And so sometimes I even wash the toilets, you know, so it's uh, so a bit of everything. But uh, uh, what, were you, <coughs> what I do, um, I'm a maintainer for the NSH package in OpenBSD. And uh, I assist the author and founder uh, of, a, of the pro NSH project, which is Chris Cabucho. Chris Cabucho is uh, an American, he's from Oregon, and he has an ISP as well. Uh, and uh, so we're kind of similar in that way, but that's where the similarities end because uh, he's a gifted programmer and uh, I'm not. <laughs> so I'll put it that way. But uh, we're. He, um, so he, I suppose if I was to talk about uh, uh, Chris, uh, he has obviously been programming since he's 13, and he, he, this project has been going on nearly 20 years himself. Uh, so it's, a, it's incredible uh, amount of work he has put into it. Stefan Sperling has been working on it over the last year, year and a half. Um, and Stefan has done incredible work in optimizing and improving the command line uh, in terms of the predict predictive text on the command lines and just improving the code factoring and stuff like that and modernizing the code. So, um, and uh, I had some two colleagues, Alan McGrath and Scott McDonald, who worked on it over a summer project as well. So, um, and obviously there's me. So I curate the wish list, which is great. So I try to. And uh, the to-do list, to list gets longer, but at least the done things are being done on them. It's, it's, it, it, it's nice to see them being finished uh, or coming to conclusion. Um, and we welcome volunteers, so if anyone else wants to code or, or help fund uh, the likes of Stefan uh, working on the project, we'd appreciate it as well. So um, why do I like OpenBSD? Well, I like it because I like the profound but brief syntax of the likes of PF at the firewall. I think the open BGPD configuration uh, language as well is just phenomenal and it's really easy to read. It's a very readable language. And I remember seeing some of the arguments that Ingo, or discussions on the forum about, uh, on, uh, uh, about let's say naming of a function. And just when you see such intense thought put into it, it means then that I have less work to do as an admin because they're trying to convey an idea or a concept in as brief a way as possible. Um, why NShell? Well, it's a CLI designed for um, the management of OpenBSD network-based appliances. That's pretty much what it is. Uh, it's to give a familiar iOS-type Cisco command line to OpenBSD. Um, and it replaces the likes of ifconfig, sysctl, and uh, the, the root. Uh, what else can I say? It lets, uh, how does one configure the network devices? Well, we can take a look. So if we were to look at something like an example where we create a VLAN 101 and a switch, and we make one of the ports a layer two tagged port, so just a standard 802.1Q tag, um, and then we are passing, let's say, a one that's just directly an access port or an untagged port, um, and we want to disable so on a brocade switch, it's simple enough. You have an, you have an interface reference, um, you know, there's 10 gigabit chassis number, card number, and port number. So it's all pretty much standard enough. But you can see the, the likes of the MTU switch mode trunk, switch mode trunk allowed VLAN add 101. So you can see it's, this is your typical network configuration uh, language that most most engineers would be familiar with. If we were to look at the Arista, again, it's a similar thing. You've got Ethernet, 
9 port uh, slash 2. So if you have a, a QSFP type interface, the slash would be referencing the sub interface of the 40 gig interface. So you'd have four 10 gig interfaces. Again, here we're seeing trunk allowed VLAN add 101 and switchboard mode trunk. So you're seeing a kind of pretty much a, a standard uh, setup. On a Cisco, it's slightly, you know, the, the theme is continuing. You see the interface reference again, the VLAN and how the VLAN is set up. And these are typical, and then even just on a TP link. So a lot of the switch manufacturers have decided, well, let's make the configs as similar as possible to make it as easy as possible for a network engineer to configure it. Um, and on a ubiquity edge switch, it's slightly different, but again, it's, you know, it's uh, my tip for anyone doing, dealing with uh, the ubiquity stuff is that there are very good switches, but the, conf the, conf the command line uh, is a little bit just left of field, and sometimes it's easier to do it in the GUI first, and then see what the actual command lines were done to actually get the, to actually get the desired configuration. Um, so did anyone notice a, a pattern emerging there between all the different switch vendors? So if we were to do the same thing with OpenBSD, we would have traditionally just edited the host name dot interface number, name and number. So in, in OpenBSD, of course, IX is a 10 gig e Intel card and they name the cards according to the driver that's actually used to run them. Um, and what that's, is that's, the one thing I like about that is, of course, is that allows us to make sure we know what capabilities of the card we're running and what, you know, so you can actually just go man IX and you'll actually get the Intel 10 gigabit as a feature set as implemented on OpenBSD. Again, <coughs> just, you know, the standard edits and then you create a bridge for the VLAN 101. And then, you know, if you're editing the ntpd.conf and you're putting in our, there are two NTP servers on our own ISP, the run and open BSD's open NTPD. Um, again, if you were to do it through an interactive or an rc.local script, you'd use these if config. So these would be the typical way at least a typical Unix admin would manage their box. Why is NSH, what, well, the problem is that if, if you have a junior engineer looking at a black flashing cursor and he doesn't know what files to look at, doesn't know where the config is, how it is to make it, the configuration more accessible, okay? Um, so with NShell, you can just simply do show running config and you'll get this type of interface. So this is all running on an OpenBSD box and uh, you have your bridge reference and then the members of the port. So you've got VLAN 101, and we can see VLAN 101 is, has a parent, you know, it's, it's actually a tagged interface on a parent uh, IX1. So that's, that, so th that is your, effectively your, the, the way the end shell configuration is done. <coughs> so if you're new to end shell and you're not sure, what you can actually do is just run it and use it just to read the configuration. And, and it can be useful for a Cisco head or a network guy who's not familiar with open, you know, if you were having an issue and you wanted some network diagnostics, you can actually just run in shell on the box and just use show commands. So don't use it to configure anything, but just use it to query. And we will do a demo of that later and we can show you this, the, the, the actual feature sets there. But again, it's, <laughs> so there's been a couple of recent improvements that I'm really happy with. So those of you with muscle memory will know that uh, Cisco, generally you would type VLAN space VLAN number, and that's the interface name. But of course, in OpenBSD and FreeBSD, you don't put a space between the interface and the number. It's, you know, it's VLAN 101 and it's all. So what we have tried to do here is to, we're, we're trying to move Enshell that, I think all of us have been frustrated when you're working on one switch vendor and then you move to a different vendor and your muscle memory no longer works and you feel a bit slow because you can't type it in properly. Yeah? So or, given that you know, NSH is across the three fields, why not just accept it? We do. 
So oh, well, it, it, it just tells you, it just tells you, look, it's, uh, oh. so it, what it'll actually do is if you do VLAN space 100 or VLAN 100, it'll work either way. And the idea was, but it's, so what we've done is we've made NShell to be flexible in interactive uh, interaction with it because we're all human. Um, but in terms of reading the files, it's strict. So if, when it actually writes that config out, it won't have the space in it. So these were just things that I found frustrating about uh, NShell when I was initially using it and also coming from, let's say, Cisco or Arista background. Because um, I will say that I think Arista probably has the best command line uh, by a long, long, it's just beautiful. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's it just, yeah, it's, it just gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. If a command line could, then it, that's the one. And so, so I'm trying to get Enshell to give you all a warm, fuzzy feeling, you know? Um, and uh, so that's... <coughs> Uh, so what, what else can I say? We also have show active config. So any of you who have worked on big switch configurations will know uh, you get, get fairly tired of trying to scroll and find the exact place you're, you're trying to configure. Um, and also those of you with uh, maybe the attention span of a goldfish like myself, you might just say, what's this configuration again? Um, and you don't want to have to scroll. So what's useful about that is if you're on a switch or a router and you're going, am I on the correct interface? You can just simply go show active and you'll actually see the configuration before. Um, and th so I typically, if I'm turning up a port for a customer, I would go show active configuration, see what's there, what am I dealing with, then write the commands in, and then go, did the commands take, so just show active again. Um, so in that interface mode, so it's available on the interfaces and on bridges, so that particular one, okay? Um, the Command line help has been improved as well. Um, there's been a couple of things we've done. We've gone with the, what we've, if you do PF and a question mark or PF or any command and a question mark, it'll list uh, a, a kind of a brief text based help. Um, or if you're just in a rush and you're just trying to find out what commands are available, if you double tab, it'll actually list the, the options you have available to you. So we've been trying to, uh, in fairness, I think Microtech's uh, command line completion is pretty good as well. Um, and so it was trying to get, um, it was trying to get that type of uh, user experience uh, on. Yeah, and it's just, it's nicer. Um, and then of course, if you do, <laughs> you know, it, we also have the double tab context help as well. Um, so if you're, if, just to explain, um, and that's another example of where we're flexible. So most people would use configure IPs on an interface with IP. In uh, OpenBSD, we use INET, is, you know, so what happens is it goes, okay, you're putting an IP address on it. And when it saves it to file, it'll actually use INET as the command, you know, to, so, um, and we'll show you that, I can show you that in the demo later on as well. Um, what also we did was, the br um, Thanks to Ingo um, and his ma massive work on the manual pages, uh, I didn't realize how lovely the man pages can be. And particularly if you're reading text files, just if you read a normal text file compared to actually a manual, you, there's actually subtleties in the manual interface that, uh, you know, in terms of highlighting and tags and stuff like that. So what we've done is we've added a manual command, so it's the, uh, in, in Enshell, and when you type manual and bridge, what we've actually done is we've used the tag feature in the manuals. So if you type manual bridge, it'll actually open up the Enshell. It's like typing man NSH, and it'll jump to the tag with bridge or, and so wherever it, it, I've been writing them, and so I've written the manual on, on Enshell, and what we've tried to do is, that if you're searching for something, you can just hit, keep hitting T, and it'll jump to the next mention of bridge in that manual. Yes? I love BSD cams because from me, 12 years ago, they're not <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you did this, did you? No, but uh, I was the one that suggested that to you. Okay, well, I have to say, it, it, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, thank you for suggesting it, okay, but he didn't write it now, just to be, let the record show Adam Thompson didn't write the code. He, <laughs> no, I do love that. 
Well, it's one thing I do like about BSD CAN is that you can actually meet the people who write code and do stuff. And you can say, hey, could you make my life even easier? And, then, uh, and it's amazing how some people then come back with a diff the following day and go, hey, try out this patch. Um, and Claudio did that once for me as well. So just a big shout out to the, that, the community that you are, you know, and I really mean that. Um, so yeah, you've got this manual. So if you're like manual switch or manual VLAN, it'll be, there'll be tags in there. And I've tried to write the manual as comprehensively as possible with tags to help people who, because they're the type of help. So you've got brief help, uh, you've, um, and then you've in, in end shell built in, and then we have the manual command, which is um, basically man edis, man nsh.8 with, uh, with, but we're actually using the tag. So whatever you put after manual, it'll search for, okay? Um, check config command. Um, so I was, I remember when I initially started with N, uh, uh, trying to use NSH, I was like, oh, it'd be lovely if you do syntax checking. And uh, Chris goes, it does. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay, fair enough. So uh, then what I said was, sometimes it's nice to know that the, the commands that you're starting with are working before. So you can actually do PF check config. And if it works well, it'll just list out. And it's the same as PFCTL minus NVVF. Um, so it'll actually list out the rules as, as they are. Or um, it'll tell you that you have an error on line number eight in this case. So we'll, we'll go through that. Um, we also added a config mode. Um, and this was because uh, I think, how, how many of you have been turning up a customer router that's on you beside you on the bench, but you also have a core router that's quite important, and you dump the config into the core router and not the router beside you. Uh, it oh. never ever happened to me at all, but um, <laughs> and so I never so. But I felt that we needed to have so this config mode means, you know, so you only go into config mode when you actually intend to change the configuration on the device. Now, of course, you can screw up that safety feature by just having a line called config at the very top of your script. So, um, you know, if, uh, if, if, that's, if you like to do the yeehaw, school of yeehaw uh, kind of networking, that's what you do there. Um, what else can I say about it? Uh, so we've obviously the privilege, so you have also unprivileged modes with NShell, so that's for like your junior staff who don't, are allowed to look and do some basic diagnostics but not modify the configuration or look at uh, keys. Um, improvements, we've added WireGuard support, and we've added uh, the, the UMB uh, device driver support as well, so you can configure SIM cards and, um, and uh, you know, 5G or 4G modems that are supported by OpenBSD. So <coughs> what we've also done is we've tried to integ integrate, uh, improve the user who might want to try out OpenBSD and NShell. So we have a script that uh, takes it from a basic, it takes the basic imports, the defaults, and pulls them in to NShell and, and makes effectively NShell run as the, uh, the the main configuration tool for OpenBSD. And so that will allow, so it's like, it basically imports the files, labels them properly. Uh, so your config files from Etsy will be then put into var run. Um, but it is for basic configuration. If you have loads of routing domains and loads of daemons running, uh, import it yourself manually, you know. But, uh, but it is just for getting someone started when it's coming uh, with a fresh open BSD box out of the box. Um, the roadmaps that we've been focused on for the last year, year and a half, has been usability, usability, usability. Uh, Read-only diagnostics, so really trying to expand the show commands. Uh, so. Any of you from the Cisco or Arista world will know the show, show everything, show blah, uh, show BGP, show IP, show roots. Um, and we also, have, we've tried to improve the, the uh, usability, like for basically OpenBSD systems with lots of VLANs and lots of interfaces. We have show interface status. So those types of nice commands that say, oh, which ports are up, which ones are down. The typical stuff you would use on a, an Arista or a Cisco switch every day. Uh, when you're running them. Um, um, we also, the documentation, we've been quite focused on that. So we've, we did convert the text-based manual 
to uh, the, uh, the pro tip for you guys. If you're ever doing it, man doc for the first time, uh, do not copy the corn shell script uh, manual page and think you're going to fashion that into, because <laughs> it's quite a comprehensive manual page, but uh, that was the one I did. Uh, and uh, what I probably should have done was look at a few other manual pages that might be an easier example to work with. Um, but uh, that's what I did anyway. But uh, so we, we took the, the corn shell uh, manual page and then I, I basically made it at the end shell manage, um, manual page. And it took about a month. And then, uh, then Ingo gave me feedback, and it's kind of cool when you, I can email someone and say, can anyone uh, give me feedback on this manual page? And the guy who writes the language gives you feedback on your first manual page. And then based on his feedback, I had another two weeks of work to clean it up and make it more. Um, I remember he was saying, uh, you have an example in every command. Because uh, I said, is, is it too many, too much examples? And uh, he goes, you're asking because you know <laughs> that it was too many examples in the manual page. <laughs> no, no, but it, it just in the manual page, it's maybe, for, it's maybe for that book that I always never got around to writing, you know. Uh, I'm not like Mike Lucas or Peter Hanstein, uh, you know, who actually publish books, you know. Um, the other thing I was going to say is uh, we want also to have identity um, configuration handling for automation. So that's just where you, you know, when you're running the commands that you're absolutely certain that they're, they, they don't, that if you run it once, it's the same state. You run it twice, it'll be the same state and it won't. An example of that would be delete interface one. If you run that command one, it'll delete the first interface that, you know, encounters or something like that. But if you run it a second time, you're now deleting the second and the first. So it's just stuff like that. Um, what else was I going to say? Solicit funding, just for privilege separate, because the, uh, privilege, we would like to have it more like the OpenBSD uh, type, uh, you know, privilege separate, it's like a client server application where you have the, what's actually interacting with the kernel will be running as root, but that the command interpreter will be uh, a privilege uh, separated uh, daemon. So that's, that's um, and also, when we, if we have the PrivSep model set up, it then makes it safer then to start looking at maybe having a web-based interface. Um, initially, if I was doing the web-based interface, it wouldn't be for a nice GUI, it would be more for just automation because a lot, of, a lot of the switch vendors tend to use some sort of REST API and stuff like that to interact with their switches uh, or routers. So it was just to have that type of, um, interaction, but of course, once you have that, then you know someone can then you know do some JavaScript or, or, or you know, um, uh, uh, I digress. Sorry. Anyway, moving swiftly on. So, um, so the end shell. It, how do you install it? It's basically package add end shell, package add NSH, um, and you can either choose the the static or the dynamically linked uh, flavor. Um, and uh, you can use, and in that state, you can just use it to read the kernel state and the sysctl state and the general operation of the system. It won't be your full config because it has some, you haven't pulled, uh, the, let's say, the running, the startup config and all that. It won't have that. But it's still quite useful. Um, and then it's just obviously making NSH more, as my dad would say, get atable. And as, of course, the word is accessible, dad, accessible. But we're trying to just make the, the config more accessible. So I just want to check my time. OK. Um, and then there's ways to run. So you can run N shell interactively just by calling the N shell command. But you can also just call it to run an actual configuration script, um, like even just simple trivial ones like show running configuration to back it up. So you could do NSH minus C and then, you know, and have a script just to say show, enable show run and get your, get your config backed up off the system as well. Um, and of course, there's the NSH-I, which is actually how it starts. So it's initializing the, the, the setup of the router. Um, if you want to look at the road, roadmaps, uh, we, we use, it, the project is currently hosted on GitHub. Um, we are moving towards uh, Stefan Sperling, the legends, uh, GOT and the GOT server. And so we will be using that. But for now, it, it'll, there will always be a copy, I suppose. There will be a mirror on, on uh, GitHub. 
Um, but that's that's what we're hoping to do. Um, can everyone hear me okay there, yeah? Okay, perfect, yeah. Adam. Yeah, so, uh, so there is no, there is a web interface to got, and you can have, and it's it's kind of like a re, uh, like a very simple. It's kind of like, um, uh, you know, it's a, and you can see your diffs and stuff like that. So it's it's quite a simple, just web interface uh, to so like to uh, something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. T trademark, I'm sure, and copyright and <laughs> all sorts of stuff. But yeah, but it is, yeah. So, um, but it's uh, Stefan Sperling's um, project. Sorry, yeah. Yourself? You had a question, did you? You, yeah. Okay, you sure? Okay, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Putting people under on the spot there. So I'm going to randomly pick people and go, have you a question? Have you a question? Okay. <laughs> Um, so BSD CAN 2024 saw our first essential tutorial um, and we had uh, a few guys uh, put through their paces for a day with two virtual B, uh, open BSD boxes per, per student and it, it was a day long course and we got to set up BGP and OSPF and PF just, uh, just from scratch so it was kind of nice to, to just get people uh, inducted into uh, using Enshell on OpenBSD. Um, the high priority one is get the config syntax dialed in, so we're trying to keep it as uh, tight as possible. We've kind of now moved that we'll accept as many flexible commands like IP for IP addresses in interfaces, but we'll actually store it as what would be the term that OpenBSD would use, which is, of course, INET for IPv4 or INET6 for IPv6. So, it's, you know, just trying to kind of keep it aligned. Um, so what we have is a very flexible user interface, but very strict syntax. When you're loading it from a file, it's quite strict. Um, but that, that just makes the configuration engine a lot simpler to program. Um, and what we want to, the, there's three uh, major ones that we want to improve. Uh, NSD unbound, so for to manage the DNS setup for a small office, these 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 uh, daemons are crucial. So um, so we have a bit of work to do on that. There's a bit of a challenge around that because they're truces. So um, it's, it just in terms of the way Enshell was designed and where it's expecting config files to be. And there's the other problem, which is we have a conflicting one, and ideas are welcome. So I'm putting this out there. But if you can imagine. Nshell puts all the stuff in one file, right? And then you have a load of zone files. So how do you, how do you render the zone files uh, in Nshell? Um, so that's, that's the kind of challenge we're just uh, we're thinking about. So it's kind of a bit of a thought process going on there at the moment. Um, and just, I suppose, to improve, um, uh, we also want to improve at our test, test base and our test scripts so that when we're actually building that, we can actually test our own dog food. Um, and what we also want to do is improve on, like, the, to make use of quite, if you're not using these commands, um, you might want to. They're quite useful. Um, but, uh, like, uh, uh, there's MTR is actually missing from that. But, uh, yeah, PMA, CCT, if top, if top is, like, quick and dirty, um, if you want to see what, what's actually using the traffic on an interface, uh, if top is really good, just little command line tool for that. Um, and then, of course, there's Fastnet Mon. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So we have, the main thing is we're trying to squash bugs. It is fairly, it's, it's quite stable at the moment. Um, um, we're quite happy where, where it is. It's, it's, uh, and in fairness to Stefan, any bugs that have been pointed out have been fixed within an hour. Um, he's just ridiculously good. Um, and I, I actually have to say it's an example of where you know, you know, it's always good if you can to hire one of the developers in any of the projects because if they are contributing to free BSD, it's our open BSD. It says a lot about the person and their work ethic anyway, and their attention to detail. So if you're, get, you know, so for me, I found just working with uh, the likes of Stefan and MPI, um, it just it, I always I got way better value than what, what I was actually paying for. And I just want to say that from a small business perspective, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow, just 
in terms of my experience of just dealing with uh, open source development as in as a SME consumer and, and uh, in some cases a humble um, s supporter uh, and I mean humble in terms that it's, it's not a huge amount of money we're spending on it. Um, the other thing is there's interest from B free BSD. This guy Mohammed just randomly wrote into the <laughs> The, the end shell um, mailing list and said, hey, I've, I've ported it to FreeBSD. And I was like, great, okay, can we see the code? And um, obvi obviously there's a lot of open, because it's built for OpenBSD, there's a lot of OpenBSD-centric, uh, I suppose, functions and stuff like that. So uh, from, a, from an end shell point of view, and I can say this, that Chris and myself and Stefan, we want to see this, uh, you know, widely used. So. If people are interested in porting it to open or FreeBSD, we'd we'd help. Like if there's structural changes needed to change the code to make that easier, you know, we're all ears. So we do want to see that, um, and feedback is welcome. So you can talk to me uh, at the bar later um, over a couple of pints. Um, okay, so just saying, we've funded it for about uh, since 2022 and 2023. Um, and we've gotten it to a certain stage, um, and I have to say, Stefan Spurn was fantastic in terms of dealing with it. Um, and we are looking for additional funding, so if other people want to contribute and get more features in, we're happy to work with you on that, and we're happy to match. So if, if someone wants to put their money where their mouth is, we'll put our money where your mouth is as well. So that's that's basically, I suppose. Um, but uh, so that's the. Uh, the lecture part of it over, and now we have a half an hour, so I can actually we can do an AMA where I'm actually going to go on to an, uh, jump onto an open uh, open BSD box with Enshell and just walk you through what what it can do currently, and uh, and uh, hopefully you can then try and get me to make do things to make it explode or something like that. So. Um, how, well, like, okay, so you install OpenBSD as you would, right? So, it, um, and look, there's a lot of FAQs and how-tos in doing that. It's literally package add end shell. And then there's a script, like if you, if you download it from GitHub, so you can you get the latest one from the GitHub, you know, git clone, uh, github.com slash yellow man slash NSH, you'll get the latest package um, or latest uh, uh, whatever you call it, branch, is that it? Yeah, sorry, getting all. Uh, and then you literally, there's actually a folder called scripts, or sorry, directory called scripts there. And in there, there's another directory called shell, and then you've literally integrate NSH, an um, extensive integration script, and it literally copies the files. Do not run that on a production system that, you know, what I'm trying to say is you do it on a system that's about to be production, and then it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Run NSH, and then you're. And if you're familiar, so for the people who are Cisco heads, will or Arista heads, they they'll actually kind of be in a fairly familiar place once Enshell runs for the first time. Um, like there's been quite good. So uh, bear with me two seconds now, folks. Here we go. So I'm going to exit. What happened with Flash RD? Um, that, uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, Flash RD is still there. Uh, I haven't really used it that much. I, I, I've kept it. Um, there's also another one, Res Flash. I think it was Brian Conway did as well. So the, what Chris Capucho was trying to do with Flash RD was. How do you have an OpenBSD system running in a closet with poor cooling and all that, and you're worried about uh, power outages and stuff like that, and so the file system corruption. With so was, the idea was to actually run it like a RAM disk, and run it read only most of the time, and literally only write the config to the disk when you're actually writing the config, and the rest of the time it's a read only system. So that's what Flash RD. I. Because I wanted the support of the OpenBSD community in terms of using, it, it, I didn't want to depart too much from OpenBSD 
you know, the recommended, like the generic kernels as opposed to, to you know, being on my own. So it's just that if you're putting stuff into MISSAT or TechAT, I just want to be close enough to what the developers are using. So I haven't really used Flash, Flash, um, Flash RD that you're talking about, but it is, it's basically a RAM disk. Okay. Yeah, so, and okay, so with that in mind, hold that thought, right? And what I'm going to do is uh, give you, so I'm going to log in here, um, and I'm going to log in as NSH, the username. I just created it. Oh. Okay, so, sir. So sometimes it, it's picked up, but not always. Sorry about that. So yeah. I will do that in future. Thank you, yeah. Andrew or Albert. Okay, so you're not actually seeing which. Hold on one second. Can you see it now? Yes. Um, is this text big enough or do you want it bigger? Okay, larger. We'll see. Okay, is that okay, guys? Okay, everyone there. So we're just going to log in. I have to scroll down. Sorry, guys. Just. There we go. Okay. Okay, so first thing it comes in, functionality is limited without root privileges. So uh, N shell will just give you an unprivileged shell and if you just type question mark at the start, you'll see what you have available. So you have our table, so that allows you to change context. So if you have a multi-tenanted router, or one, one of the reasons why I would use our table is you'd have the management services in its own routing domain, and then you have everything else, like whatever production workload. So BGP and all that would run in root domain zero, but I'd have a separate root domain for SSH, SNMP, and any management functions that I'm using. So uh, and that's where the R table is useful. So you can switch R table context. Um, also, so m most people, when you want to change something, you need to get into privilege mode. So you can go enable, and again, you can use shorthand. So you, you know, so en will actually do the same thing as enable. Um, what's nice about uh, nshell as well is we're using do as. So if you do as configuration, and you say, well, the user is allowed to, um, you know, jump to. S, uh, root without a password, you can facilitate that. I'm not saying that's recommended. But if do as isn't configured, it'll fall back to su. So it'll just use the su command to get super user. Okay? So I'm just going to do this now. And now we've got privileged. So you can see the command prompt has just slightly changed. Um, again, you'll have a more larger. Uh, you'll have a larger uh, kind of config options available to you now. And then we can actually go into uh, uh, configure mode. And then we could go PF edit, or if we're not sure, we can go PF question mark, and then we can go PF edit. Okay, sorry. No, no, it's all good, all good. Um, so yeah, so basically, I'm just gonna make a, an edit here, um, and I'm going to say, uh, on VIO one for Ireland. Not a very recommended one, but it'll actually, so we've just added in that. So that's staged, so that configuration has been tested there, but it's not actually applied. Um, and we can just go, we can show PF rules, and there's no PF rules at the moment, okay, so. Uh, and then we can go to show, and then we can go check config, PF, 
check config and it'll do it'll tell me what the config will be like when we when we apply it and then we can just do pf reload and now the configuration is there is loaded and there's the show pf show pf rules is showing the active rule set the check config is showing you the one is checking the config that you've staged but not applied yet so it's quite a nice feature now let's see we can also then just edit if we edit the pf configuration i'm going to put in some nonsensical stuff that guaranteed to be a syntax error um, and so it'll actually tell you there's a syntax error if you try to load that config it will not uh, if I try to do pf reload it'll tell you no you can't because there's a syntax okay so there's, there's quite a bit of checks and balances there we can then just go pf edit again get rid of Tom's madness hit save now we can also do okay well let's just do a, a compare the running config so one of my favorite features which Stefan implemented r last year uh, was a show config sorry show diff config and it'll actually show you what has been modified since the uh, between the start of configuration and the running configuration so it's kind of nice um, and you can see so I can just go so if I do a right config and now if I do a show diff there'll be nothing there because there's no difference so if I go back in um, so if we wanted to look at the OSPF configuration we could just simply go we can do show we can go OSPF sorry OSPF and so we're wrapping around you can see here so it's not like we've reinvented the OpenBSD configuration languages or anything like that we are using the PFCTL, we're using the CTL or the control programs as much as possible and we're wrapping around the syntax. Um, but the advantage of that is it allows you to stage config and then apply it. And that's, that's the nice thing about it. So you're kind of getting that iOS XR. So any of you have had, the more expensive routers allow you to actually stage configuration, validate stuff and then apply it uh, atomically. And so that, with this you actually get a lot of that feature set as well which is kind of nice um, so here like you can see we've just we've set up a very simple OSPF router here we've got area zero we've added in the main the external interface to OSPF on this particular router and loop back one and two um, I would always recommend if you are doing um, OSPF with maker or sorry with OpenBSD is to use separate um, loopbacks interfaces for uh, w you know the IP addresses like you know so if you have an IP address that you want to put on a loopback don't put it on LO0 create another loopback and the reason for that is you don't want 127.0.0.1 slash 8 advertised in your OSPF space it's just annoying <laughs> it doesn't look at all right so just by, by, by creating a separate loopback interface you can do that. So I'm just going to go exit out of that. Um, you, it will use whichever is your preferred editor. So my preferred editor is MG because I'm human, um, and uh, <laughs> so that uh, and I'm not superhuman. That because obviously those people would use VI. So just save, just save, <laughs> save the. Just lost half of you there for a second or two. Now you're back. You're back. Okay. So, but like one of the things just to to to. Um, uh, you know, so we're just using the simple, you know, the editor and the visual environment variable allows you to set whichever. Um, so if I do a show run on this, on this particular router, you're seeing, okay, the host name is Tom's Lab. We're seeing the standard uh, interface. Um, it loads it, uh, it loads the interface running configs as they were added to the kernel. So you know the way if, if you look at if config, if you add a VLAN at the, at the last VLAN that you add, it will be at the bottom of your if config if you ever list it. So it's kind of similar in that respect. So you don't see them all neatly in just in the one. Um, so you don't see all the loopbacks grouped together. All the, it's like you would if it was starting up, but not uh, when you're um, 
uh, not when you're, you're adding the config on the fly, if you get me. So we'll just keep going and you see loopback one. So there you can see. So I was using this and I was doing an Anycast DNS hijack there for uh, Google, sorry. And, uh, but um, it, it was for the purposes of a lab, this is not production. Uh, so it's just, uh, you can see the loopback interfaces there um, and you see we've IP forwarding. So that's the sysctl for IP forwarding, you know, where you have to, so by default open BSD and I'm sure FreeBSD by default don't have forwarding enabled as if they're a server they don't need to be. Um, and then of course you have to enable IP forwarding which is actually controlling the sysctl. At the moment we do control, we do support every sysctl that's modifiable in OpenBSD is, is available to you as an NCHL user. Um, and uh, so you can see the routes that have been added and then you've got the PF rules. So you can see the, and so, so literally PF rules is like the start of the, of the uh, pf.conf file. So that's what we're doing. We're just pulling in the pf.conf file and just displaying it in one screen. And then you see the OSPF rules and that's the OSPF rules is actually the OSPF config file being just loaded up. Um, and then we've got BGP. And we're just, you know, going through it. And there's a real AD configuration there as well. And then there's NTP. And then of course the venerable SSHD, SSH daemon. So let's, what else can I do? Well, we could go show OSPF fib. And it'll tell me, you know, where's the next hop and what OSPF we can do show BGP rib. And you can see that there's some uh, BGP neighbors that are there. We can also do show BGP summary. So these are things that you would, that's literally BGP CTL uh, show summary. You know, if you were using the OpenBSD BGP, um, BGP CTL daemon, or sorry, program. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, you can do it. Um, yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> Chris and Stefan did that work. But yeah, it, uh, that's the cool thing about it. If you go show, you can do question mark and it'll give you a list of what you can query. So we can go show uh, PF. So we can go show PF all and that's, sorry, not three alls. And again, you can, you can be quite lazy, just do sh space ru show run and all that. But here you're getting the list of, that's like pfctl minus s a. I'm going to double check, but like that's, you know, so that's just the PF control. We're just using the OpenBSD tools that are available and we've just put them into command structure that most network engineers are familiar with. So we could go show, we will show interface status. So we've literally what you'd expect, which will show you obviously the interfaces, it'll show you the routing domain they're in and the type of device they are. This is quite useful for, you know, if you have a, if you're using it to aggregate links, you know, VLANs and stuff like that, you can see it. And that's, again, um, it was just to try and make it as e easy to use as possible. Um, um, you can also then just go show a route and you've got your route tables um, being populated there. Um, we, you know, there's, <coughs> there's other stuff. Um, I'm trying to think, but like, so then if we go, uh, I'm just going to go config, diff, diff config, see if there's no changes, no, there hasn't been. We can also go show DSP, so we have DSP leases, and so it'll list the leases that you have put out as a, uh, if you're running a DSP server on the box, so that's just literally querying the, the lease DB uh, that DHCPD has. So if you go DHCP, edit. One of the nicest features we've done um, with this, and um, it was, uh, uh, and one of the, the great ways, 
Most people who are setting up a config daemon for the first time will always use the examples. And for any of you who are trying to play with OpenBSD, what I would strongly suggest is that if you go into Etsy examples, there is a fantastic, just for any of the daemons there, there's actually an example file that, uh, uh, and I'll just give you an example. So if I do, um, uh, so that's the dspd.conf, sorry, no. Yes, I really want to go, to let me out. Okay, we're back. So if we go to, if for instance, if we wanted to do, um, I'm trying to think, oh, really the edit. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna clear the config on this, right? Sorry about this, I'm just clearing the file. Now, what happens here is if I go to relay edit for the first time and it's an empty config file, it'll actually say, hey, do you want me to load a, 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 rather than just giving you a black screen with nothing in it, it'll say, do you want me to load a, an example config? And that I think is quite useful in making it more accessible for engineers who are using, uh, using each, any of the daemons, because that literally gets you your, okay, well I need, if you're setting up relay D, you have your internal host there and you can work with that. Um, if we, I'm trying to remember each time where the example file was. Exactly. So it's just a look. So it's in ATC examples. It literally copies the, the, the example files there. Um, what else can I show you? Um, the, one of the big things that uh, uh, Steph had really worked on was improving uh, the command line uh, completion. It's not fully done. Like, so we're... we're we're currently migrating it, but like the likes of uh, show PF, and then you can go question mark, and it kind of gives you a list of what actual ones you can look at, so we can show states. Uh, and we can see stuff like that, you know. So you have, um, it was actually one of the things I was uh, discussing with Chris and Stefan was, perhaps we need a, a looking glass type, um, and so there is actually a, a looking glass, there's a BGP LG looking glass based on NSH as well. So we are working on that and it's uh, hopefully eventually going to replace the, the BGP LG in, in base itself. Um, but like it's, um, but it, it was one of those things that I wanted to, to, to get out of it and perhaps have a read only binary that you know only does looking at configs but doesn't break them or you know, like, so it just shows you the state. Um, has anyone any questions so far, or do you want? So if I go to BGP edit. So. It'll tell me there's a syntax error again. Um, and you can go. And it'll actually list the check config and it'll do it verbose. So if, if the check config allows for, a, if, if the BGP to control daemon or any of the daemons have a, a good or an extensive uh, syntax checker, it will actually, will we'll use that in the end shell to give you that, that output, you know. So it's like verbose. So for instance, if you go PF check config, what you're actually getting is, you know, the way one of the cool things about OpenBSD is in PF, and I'm sure it's in FreeBSD as well, is that you can check your config and simulate what it would do without actually applying it. And that's PFCTL minus N. If you use the N, not the N word, the N letter. <laughs> I, I once uh, mistakenly said, I've prefixed any new file with the N word. And it was like, no, no, the N letter, it's the N letter. <laughs> so it was just to point that out. So, um, Moving swiftly on, <laughs> coming back, coming back from the edge. Uh, really quick question: uh, Is it set up? Is NSH set up so that I could say apply hooks? So could I could I set it up so that when I write a config, this hook is called as well as whatever the default is? Is that something that is an option? Is that something that you would like to see eventually? 
Um, not just for like that particular state change, but like any of the, do you expect to have hooks? Do you have hooks now? Um, okay, I need to, so, so what you're saying is that if you run a particular daemon that you want to also kick off. Yeah, like if, if I'm modifying a BCP config, yeah. I want that on multiple machines. Or let's just, that's a okay. prime example. But I could have a script that does the FTP for it or whatever else. Yeah. So at the moment, you can have, so and we're running Enshell there as interactive, right? So we're the human talking about it. What you can do is use Enshell. Um, so um, what you can do is use Enshell with the minus C uh, command line switch and then a script. And it can be as trivial as show, enable show running config you know, just to basically pull uh, the, the, the running config uh, uh, off a system if you were doing it with SCP or Ansible or something like that. I need more feedback and more ideas than that because uh, I don't do enough automation um, because no one can do enough automation, but I don't do any automation by, by <laughs> per se. And it is, it's, it is um, an Achilles heel. Uh, so I, I would like the perspective of the automation aficionados and I'm staring at someone in particular called Max Stuckey, who's going to help me with this. The legend. Okay. <laughs> so, yes? Uh, haven't tried it. Is it there's, okay, there's some, there's some challenges with that, right? Because, sorry, he's asking what happens if you if you ch root uh, n shell. Um, you can do it, but the problem is um, you have a load of daemons that you're trying to control as God, as in as root, that you would need access to. So the, I put it to like this: the privset model, and let's say that type of mitigate, let's say security measure like Chirut, Um There's some conflicted goals there. Like if first of all you need to be able to access all the other config spaces of daemons that are also running in their own Chirut jails. You can do it, like even on the ports. In the ports, you do a, have you have what you call a fake install or something like that. Same, same concept. I've used that actually uh, when I was testing, which obviously is not full testing, but it's testing of enough. What am I? Oh, oh yeah. It's, oh yeah. It's, I'm almost out of time. But I have to just do one bit more humble brag, right? So if we do manual, and then go VLAN. It'll actually, and did you notice this actually, the tags are also listed. So if you do manual, as part of the build process is we'll actually do a search of the manual to see what tags are there. And so we actually can do the predicted command line. So if you do manual VLAN, and then if you type T again, it'll tell you the next place where it's mentioned in the manual. And then you can go back by hitting shift T. And that, I've been using manual for about 20 odd years. And I didn't know about tags until uh, last year, so there you go, and I, so that's, that's basically it. That's the uh, end of the talk, you can catch me in the bar, um, and look, I think donate early and donate often to the various different, your preferred BSD, uh, it is important in what you do, and I know a lot of you are contributors, and I just want to say each and every one of line of code that you've done has made my life easier, and uh, you know, I have to say the stability of OpenBSD and FreeBSD and particularly what, in the context that I use them for myself and my own company is great and it allows me to give good internet to small businesses in rural Ireland and also, uh, you know, and it just, it does it at a really uh, better than a lot of the commercial offerings out there. So I just want to say serious props to you all. Guys, thank you very much.